So he, that is Jesus, said to them, this kind cannot or can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Say, this kind can come out by nothing but by prayer and fasting. That, that statement was made by Jesus in response to a question his disciples asked him um, when they prayed for a young man who was deaf and dumb and who was indwelled by a demon and his disciples prayed for the boy. The father had brought the boy to, G to his disciples and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they didn't get a breakthrough. The boy continued to be dumb and, and deaf and, and continued to be oppressed. And, and so they failed. Uh, and then Jesus came down from the Mount Transfiguration and the crowds ran towards Jesus and the little boy's father came to Jesus and said, I brought my, my son to you. Uh, your disciples prayed for him, but they were not able to help him. And he said, and Lord, if there's anything you can do for my son, please have compassion on us and do it. And then Jesus turned to the, to the, to the father and said, listen, if you believe... If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. That's what he said. If you can believe, all things are possible. Say, if I can believe, all things are possible. Amen. All things are possible to God and all things are possible to the one who believes. And so Jesus then turned to the young man and spoke to the, to the spirit that was causing his problem and commanded the spirit to come out. I charge you, said Jesus, come out. And immediately the spirit came out of the boy and he began to speak, he began to hear, and uh, he, was, he was made whole, the Bible says. So here's an instance where clearly God's will was for this young man to be well. But here, here's also an instance where the disciples prayed and they did not get the breakthrough. And so later when they were alone with Jesus, they said, Lord, how come we were not able to cast that spirit out? Why were we unable to get the breakthrough? Why were we unable to help this young man? And Jesus said to them two things in Mark chapter, in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus says to them, because of your unbelief. And then in this passage, Jesus went on to say, it, it, he says, um, this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. So this is our year of miracles. Last week we talked about the importance of prayer. Today I want to talk about fasting for your miracles. Say fasting. fasting. Say fasting. fasting. There's a time, there's, there, 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 there's a need, there's a place for fasting in the believer's life. And this particular instance revealed to us uh, the fact that there are certain types of problems, certain type of circumstances and situations we may find ourselves in from time to time that will not respond to prayer alone. Hmm? Now, we're full, th this world is full of problems, and they come in all shapes and sizes, correct? Is, is there anybody here who doesn't know anything about problems? Okay, so we know we have that in common, right? They come in all shapes and forms and sizes. And some problems are of, a, of, of, a, of such a nature that we can deal with it ourselves. We don't even have to pray. We can solve it ourselves. And then, those, then there are those kinds of problems that are too big for us. And we don't have the ability to solve them ourselves. So we go to God and we can pray. And if we pray and believe, you know, prayer alone. It's all that it takes, and God intervenes, and the problem is solved. And we thank God for that. But we learn in this story that there seems to be a third category of problems, which Jesus called this kind. Amen? In, in Mark chapter 9, he said this kind. There's a third category of problems called this kind, which won't be solved by prayer alone. Mm -hmm. there, there's some issues, there's some things, there's some circumstances that we deal with in life <clears throat> that if we're going to get the breakthrough, we're going to have to pray, but we're going to have to, to, to supercharge our prayers, <laughs> reinforce our prayers. Are you hearing me? We're fasting. And here is one example. 
in the scriptures. And, 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 and this, again, is to reveal to us that there is a need in your life and my life for us to practice not just praying, but learning how to combine fasting with prayers. Because there are certain things that if you don't combine fasting with your prayers, you will not experience your breakthrough. Okay? So, I want to teach on this. Today, we start our 21 days of prayer and fasting, and I pray that all of you would, would be a part of that. Say prayer, prayer. and fasting. Yes. Not prayer and dieting. <clears throat> Jesus didn't say this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and dieting. I know we've had fast in the past, but the truth is, men and people what they call a fast is just a form of dieting. And, the, and their greatest motivation is to lose weight. <clears throat> or they fast for health reasons. So good, 21 days I can lose some weight. And what's motivating them is the opportunity to share some pounds or just get healthier. And listen, I believe that that's a good thing if you're, if you're, if, if for health reasons you need to, to, to watch what you eat, limit what you eat, that's a good thing. But that is dieting. That is not fasting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't want you to enter this 21 days of prayer and fasting with a, with a dietist mentality. Let's enter it with a fasting mentality. And I will tell you what's the, what, what is a true biblical fast. Amen? But these disciples had on many other occasions cast out devils. They had. You remember Jesus gave them the authority over demons and they had gone out and come back and the Bible says they were rejoicing that even the devils are subject to us in their name, in your name. So they had experience at praying and casting out demons and they had seen many answers to prayer, many breakthroughs, simply praying and using the name of Jesus. But there was something about this case that was different. Mm, there was something about this situation that whatever they had done before that worked, wasn't working. Mm, and so when they were able to get Jesus by himself, the question was, why couldn't we do it? Why did it work before and why didn't this work? Why didn't we get the same results? And Jesus answers them in, in, uh, in, in two ways. The first thing he said, and that's what we read in, or we refer to in Mark, Matthew chapter 17, was the reason you couldn't do this, the reason you didn't get the breakthrough, the reason you didn't get the answer you were looking for, the reason you didn't solve this problem was because of unbelief. That's what he said, because of unbelief. And, that, and then Jesus said, you know what, if you say to this mountain, be removed. Even if you have faith that's a mustard seed, and you sit in this mountain, be removed, it'll obey you. But in this case, you spoke to this mountain, it didn't obey you, and the reason it didn't obey you, the reason it didn't get breakthrough is because of unbelief. Which means the disciples were doing what they had done before. They were using the name of Jesus, they were praying about this situation, they were commanding a breakthrough. But while they were doing this, they were also having a lot of trouble with unbelief. They were having a lot of trouble believing that this thing they were looking at was going to respond to them. You know that certain circumstances and certain situations and certain types of tests, you can be praying, but when you see the thing and you consider it, especially if it's been there a long time, like this boy's problem, it can be hard to believe. And so you're doing your best to pray, but what you're seeing or what you're hearing can cause you to have a battle with unbelief regarding a breakthrough in that area. Isn't that so? And that, that is, that, that is, that is when, when, when you're going to need to do more than just pray. When you are dealing with a situation and, and the, the, the nature of it causes you to have a lot of doubts concerning the outcome, concerning the desired results, you need to do more than pray. That's when 
you need to supercharge, reinforce your prayer with fasting. So unbelief prevented the breakthrough. Say to your neighbor, unbelief is a bad thing. Amen? Unbelief is something you want to resist, and you always want to be resisting unbelief like the plague. Because unbelief will prevent you or prevent me from truly experiencing all that God has for us. Unbelief will prevent us from walking into the, walking in the fullness of our inheritance. Unbelief will, will, will limit. It's the, it's the greatest limiter of the miraculous in our lives. Uh, unbelief is the greatest hindrance to our prayers. And so we want to always be resisting unbelief. The less unbelief I have or allow in my life at any point in time, the more miracles I can experience. The less unbelief I allow in my life at any point in time, the more of God's power I can walk in. If every time I prayed or every time you prayed, there was no unbelief, guess what would happen? You would get 100% answers to your prayer. If every time you spoke to a situation in Jesus' name, assuming this is God's will, and you spoke to it in Jesus' name without any unbelief, every mountain you speak to in Jesus' name would obey you. Hmm? Now, none of us are there. I'm not. You're not. But it's good, it's good to know why we're not experiencing the same kind of results Jesus experienced. Because Jesus dealt with the same problem here, and he got the result. The disciples dealt with it. They didn't. And Jesus said, the reason why I did it and you didn't was because of unbelief. In other words, you had a problem with unbelief. I didn't. When I spoke to the demon, or when I spoke to this situation, or when I prayed, I, Jesus, didn't have a problem with unbelief. When you were speaking, you had, you, you had some unbelief issues, and that limited what God could do through you. All right? So we want to deal with unbelief because it limits the miraculous flow of God. It limits our ability to experience all that God wants for us to have. So, if then unbelief is a problem, the question is, how do we overcome it? How do we overcome the unbelief that hinders us from receiving our breakthrough, which we know God wants us to have? How do we overcome the unbelief that hinders us from getting victory when we're dealing with this kind of problem, whatever it is? And, and let me say this, this kind of problem may be one thing for me, it may be something else for you. For instance, some of us have great faith when we're praying for finances. And we can see breakthroughs in that area. But when it comes to praying for maybe health, we, we have a lot of unbelief in that area. So for us, th we might find ourselves dealing with more unbelief when we're praying for the sick, where we have no problem believing for financial miracles. You follow me? Are you listening? Wh wh whatever the unbelief is at work, you want to resist it because it is placing limits on God's grace and God's blessings in that area. So the question is then, unbelief is a hindrance. Unbelief is placing limits on my, on my ability to receive from God. It's placing limits on my ability for God to, God's power to work in my life. How do I overcome it? I believe that's why Jesus went on to say to them, this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. In other words, the reason you couldn't do this was because of unbelief. The unbelief you had hindered this miracle. And so if you now can get over that unbelief, you will be able to experience that miracle. So how do you overcome the unbelief that kept you from receiving the miracle in this case? He says it's by prayer and say fasting. Not just prayer, but prayer and fasting. What Jesus is teaching here, he's showing us how to deal with unbelief in our lives. He's showing us how to resist unbelief. He's showing us how to decrease unbelief. He's showing us how to overcome unbelief. If we're dealing with unbelief, and all of us are, to some degree, dealing with it, he says the way to resist it is to engage not just in prayer, but fasting. You know, fasting is one of the most effective ways of overcoming unbelief. Are you listening to me? That was weak. I said fasting, biblical fasting, is one of the most effective ways of overcoming unbelief. 
and I'll, 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 share, I'll share with you why, okay? Now, when you pray and you fast, keep in mind that fasting, the reason for fasting is not to change God. We're not going to 21 days of prayer and fasting to change God. God doesn't need to be changed. God already loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Now, do you want, you want that to change? Aren't you, you want it to remain just that way? Amen. God loves you. Jesus said it. The Father loves you as much as he loves me. So Jesus says, I don't even have to pray to God for you because God the Father loves you as much as he loves me. So God's love for you is as strong as his love for Jesus. So God doesn't need to be changed. So you're not fasting to change God or change God's mind. You're not fasting in order to move God. Guess what? God has already moved. When God sent Jesus to die for you and me on the cross, God was moving powerfully. Amen. When Jesus went on the cross and took upon himself your sin and my sin and the curse, uh, God was moving powerfully for you and me. When Jesus resurrected from the grave, God was moving powerfully to bring deliverance and salvation and healing and, and, and forgiveness of sins for you and me. When God sent the Holy Spirit to come back and now live inside of you and me as he does, God was moving. When God made these wonderful promises in his word, he was moving. So we don't need to fast to change God because God already loves us as much as he loves Jesus. We don't have to fast to try to get God to move because God already has moved and God is already moving. Amen. So, so that's not the purpose. It's not like God sitting there and said, let me see if you can suffer and, 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 and let's see how, how serious you are before I'm... No, 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 no. Amen. And you're not fasting in order to convince God. God doesn't need to be convinced to bless you. He doesn't need to be convinced to help you. Amen. He's already convinced. Amen. That, that you need help and he wants to help you. He's already convinced you can't help yourself. Do you understand? So listen to me. We're not going to be fasting for the next 21 days to, to, to change God, to move God, or to convince God. So if God doesn't need to be changed, God doesn't need to move, and God doesn't need to be convinced, who needs to change, who needs to move, and who needs to be convinced? You and me. So that's why we're going into this time of fasting, because we need to be changed. So fasting will not change your circumstances, but fasting, if you do it biblically, not dieting, but fasting, will do some powerful things. It'll change you in many ways. Amen? It'll change your attitude towards your problem. It'll change your attitude towards God. It'll change your attitude towards yourself. Are you hear me? It'll change your mentality. It'll do a lot of things in, that will change you and, and in the process empower you to be able to deal with what you have to deal with to get to where you know God wants you to get to. Amen? Amen? So it's going to change you and, and, and it's going to move you. It's not going to move God, but it's going to move you closer to him. It's going to move you. Hallelujah. And guess what? If you fast biblically, it's going to cause you to become convinced more than ever before of God's promises, of God's plan, of God's power, of God's goodness, of God's nature. Are you hearing me? So you're going to come out of this 21 days of prayer and fasting more convinced than ever that God loves you, that God has a purpose for you, that God is working in your life, that God is giving you victory. All things are working together for your good, and this thing you're praying for is going to come to pass. Man, no longer how long it's been there, no longer how it's chronic. You're going to come out of there with greater faith and greater boldness, greater confidence, ready to walk in victory. Turn to your neighbor, are you ready to change? Amen. Don't think of this time of fasting as punishment. Don't think of that like God is calling you to sacrifice because you got to suffer before God blesses you. The Bible says God doesn't delight in sacrifice. Amen. It's not about you sacrificing. Jesus already sacrificed. Amen. This time of fasting is a prescription. God is prescribing for us a way of empowerment. It is a way of uh, advancement spiritual, a way of empowerment, a way of spiritual upliftment. He's prescribing that. And if we go into this fast understanding its purpose, then we'll come out of it the right way. 
Amen. Listen to me. You know, opportunities come. And many people don't recognize opportunities and opportunities pass them by. The 21 days here is an opportunity that I'm not going to let pass. It's an opportunity for spiritual empowerment. And I need some spiritual empowerment. Anybody here needs one? Amen. It's an opportunity for spiritual advancement. I need to advance spiritually. There's an opportunity for spiritual upliftment. I need to be uplifted. So we have an opportunity. I'm going to, by the grace of God, take advantage of it. And I want to encourage you to take advantage of this. You may have never fasted before. And you cannot imagine fasting for 21 days because you figure you would die. Amen. Now, we're not asking you to, 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 to go without any food, but, but we are asking you to fast and not diet. Are you hearing me? So, I want to challenge you. Let's, let's cease the moment for, and let's enter the fast properly so that we can experience the spiritual advancement and empowerment and upliftment that God has for us. Hallelujah. Now, here is one of the, 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 the reasons why fasting is so important and so helpful. I already said it changes you. It, 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 it has an impact upon your minds. I, I, how many of you know that the, 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 the major spiritual battles are fought and won or lost in the mind? Amen. Satan bombards our minds. He uses uh, physical things that we see and, and, and our physical senses in order to, to bombard our mind with lies and with doubts. I hear me. And so fasting is, is so helpful and so powerful because I know when I fast, I, and that's my experience, I suspect it's the experience of many people. When I fast, uh, The, the influence of my physical senses on my mind is lessened. It's weakened. Huh? When I engage in a fast, my physical, the influence of my physical senses on my, on my mind weakens. And the influence of my spiritual senses on my mind increases. You, 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 listen to me. You are human beings, and you, by now you should know that you are first and foremost spiritual beings. Correct? And your spirit has senses. Hmm? There are spiritual senses. And then there are physical senses. With your spirit, you are able to connect with and relate with God and with the spirit realm. With your soul, your mind, will, and emotions, you can relate to yourself. And your physical senses allow you to relate with your environment. The way God designed us to function, he designed us to function for the spirit to lead and the mind and body to follow. But because of the fall, everything got reversed. And now the body is leading. And that's why the Bible talks about carnality. When the body, our physical senses are dictating and controlling our minds and our thoughts and our emotions, then we're carnal. You follow me? And when you're being led, controlled, directed by your physical senses, unbelief will be a major problem. Because you believe and you act based upon what you see and hear. So as long as my physical senses are exerting the greatest influence upon my mind, I'm going to have a lot of problem with unbelief. But when you fast, it weakens the influence of your senses upon your, your physical senses upon your mind, and it strengthens the influence of your spiritual senses upon your mind, and you will find that you will start becoming more conscious of God and the invisible things than you were before. You become more sensitive to the things of God. And the things of God become more real. They come alive in a way that they were not alive before and almost tangible. Why? Because your spiritual senses now, that is, and those senses are in connection, they're in touch with God. Your spiritual senses now are exerting great influence upon your mind. So now the things that are, that your, your spirit is sensing is what your mind is beginning to perceive. Are you listening to me? When you fast properly, let me repeat, your spiritual senses are right now connecting to God. Your spirit is in touch with God. Your spirit is in touch with the spirit realm. But you are not conscious of that. 
because what's influencing your mind the most are your physical senses. So we're very conscious of what we can see. But when you begin to fast, you start to strengthen the influence of your spiritual senses upon your mind so that what your spirit is sensing, your mind starts to perceive. Hmm? And when that starts happening, because your, your, your mind now is sensing and perceiving what your spirit is sensing, faith becomes easier. Are you hearing me? Unbelief becomes less and less of a problem. Because now the things of God are becoming very, very real to you. Remember, remember, remember one day the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and said, Jesus, how come the Pharisees and we and the Pharisees, we fast often, but your disciples don't fast? And Jesus said to them, he said, well, when the bridegroom is present, the friends of the bridegroom don't mourn. But the time is coming when I, Jesus, the bridegroom, will be taken away. And he says, then they will fast. Notice what Jesus said. Because I'm with them right now, they don't need to fast. But when I'm taken away, they will need to fast. Why? Because while he's with them physically, they can perceive him with their mind. He's real. All right? He can, they can hear him. They can see him. They can perceive him with their mind because he's physical. So they don't need to fast because they can see him. But he says, when I'm removed, when I'm no longer there physically, then they're going to need to sharpen their spiritual senses so that they can perceive me even though I'm not there physically. And that's why they will fast. They can, are you here understanding? So they're going to fast when I'm not there physically because there's going to be a need to be conscious of my presence. Conscious of my being with them. Conscious of, of God. And, 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 and for that to happen, their spiritual senses will have to be sharpened. And so they're going to fast so that their spiritual senses can be sharpened and they can begin to sense and experience my presence and the spirit world can become real even though I'm not, they're not seeing me with these eyes. Elisha and Gehazi as an example of what I'm talking about. You know the story, how the Syrians surrounded these two men, Gehazi and the prophet Elisha. Both Elijah and Gehazi looked and they saw the Syrians on horses, armed to the teeth, and Gehazi was terrified because he knew they were coming after them. And he went to Elijah and he said, Elijah, Elijah, look what's happening, look what happened. Now Elijah was looking at the same group of people. He saw the Syrians. He saw the armies, but he wasn't afraid. He didn't have any problem with unbelief. Why? Because not only did he see the Syrians, he was able to see the angels of God. He was able to perceive the presence of God's angels and a heavenly army that was there, that was more numerous than the Syrians and there to protect them. So Elijah's spiritual senses were sharp while Gehazi's were not. And as a result, Elijah could perceive the presence of God, the angels of God in such a way that he had no unbelief. Gehazi, because of his, the dullness of his spiritual senses, could not see what was there and as a result he was full of unbelief. I'm sure you were to check it out, Elisha did far more fasting and prayer than Gehazi. And as a result, Elisha's spiritual senses were sharp. This kind does not come out but by prayer and fasting because this kind engenders a lot of unbelief in you based upon what you see, hear, and feel. And you need to overcome that unbelief so that you can really believe and the way to do it is to engage in fasting so that your spiritual senses are sharpened so that you can perceive my presence, my power, my promises in a way that is clear. Then when you speak, you will believe. It will come to pass. I see a number of you here who wear glasses. Okay, remember the first time you put on glasses. 
especially those of you who are uh, nearsighted, right? That means you can't see well f from afar. Huh? Amen? And then you, you probably didn't even know you needed glasses. And when you went to check your eyes, they say you need glasses, right? Amen? And then you put on your glasses, and all of a sudden, it was like you were in a new world. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes, yeah, a few hands can bear. You were in a new world because you were seeing things that you didn't even know existed, but that were there. And you were seeing colors in ways that you had not seen them before. Amen. You were, you were seeing people in ways that you hadn't seen them before. Amen. The, the blue was bluer. The green was greener. The red was more red. Everything was, was, was different. The, the lines were more clear and more bold. Are you hearing me? And so it was like, wow, what, look, look at what I've been missing. Hmm? You know what I'm talking about? The glasses did that for you. Now, the glasses didn't create the colors. The glasses didn't create the lines. The glasses didn't create all of those things that you're now seeing. They were there, but you could not appreciate them because you were not conscious of them. And the reason you were not conscious of them was you were not seeing them. But once you put the glasses in and you saw them, you could become conscious of it and appreciate it. That is exactly what happens when we fast. It's like we're putting on spiritual glasses. Amen. That allows us to see beyond the physical into the realm of the spirit so that God's grace becomes more prominent. Amen. The color of his grace becomes more, 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 more clear. Amen. All of the lines are there. The love of God becomes brilliant. Amen. The presence of God becomes sharp. The promises of God becomes clear. And you can see it like you've never seen these things before. And when you are more conscious of this reality, what happens? Faith is stronger. Unbelief begins to dim diminish or to disappear. And then you can pray with confidence. You can speak to the situation with confidence because you're not conscious in a way that you were not before of God's presence, God promises, God's power at work in your life. Are you listening to me? So this is an opportunity that we have been given to enter into this realm of, 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 of spiritual perception so that we can begin to fully participate in what God has already provided but which we are not enjoying as we ought because we are blind to these things. So that's why Paul often prayed all the time for you and me Eyes be open, eyes be open, eyes be open, eyes be open. I pray that their eyes will be open so they can see, so they can know. Fasting is one of the most effective ways to open our spiritual eyes and, and our spiritual senses so that we can begin to benefit from the spiritual world that is so real. Father, I see a lot of long faces. Maybe my eyes need to be shut right now. <laughs> Raise your hand and say, thank you, Lord, for the grace, you, Lord, for the grace to, fast to fast and to pray and to, pray and to, lay, hold and to lay hold of your promises, of your promises. In, Jesus in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So here's the truth that, that, that is being revealed by Jesus and that I'm trying to teach you today. Here it is. Your prayer life is going to be much more effective. Your prayers will go further. Your prayers will do more if you incorporate fasting also as a spiritual discipline in your life. Okay? Now, don't wait for a crisis to fast. I know some of us say I fast, but you only fast when you're really, really in trouble. <laughs> okay? When, when, when maybe you get some bad news, say, oh, God, I'm going to go fast, I'm going to go fast. You know, and you, you know, so you only wait for a crisis. So if you don't have a crisis, you don't fast. Yeah? If that's the case, then, then may God give you many crises. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just joking. But listen, don't wait for a crisis to fast. Hmm? Because again, remember what the purpose of, of, of the fast is, right? Primarily what it does, the effect it has upon you. You always want to be in a position where your faith is in top shape and you're resisting unbelief. You don't want to get into a situation where you're facing a major problem, a major crisis, and then you go to fast to try to deal with unbelief. Okay? Watch this. Jesus comes and he meets this young man, 
and he's in trouble, right? And he says to his disciples, the reason you couldn't was because of unbelief. This kind will not come out except by prayer and fasting. So you need some prayer and fasting to overcome the unbelief so you can deal with this kind of stuff, right? But Jesus says now prayer and fasting is required to deal with this kind of unbelief so that you can get the kind of miracles when you speak in this situation, right? But after saying that, Jesus does not say now, okay, dad, give me three days to go and pray and fast, and then I will come back and we will deal with this situation. He didn't say that. He said to his disciples, this kind does not come except by prayer and fasting. But then the next thing he does is he speaks to the young man. And right there, he deals with the crisis. He deals with the problem. So obviously, Jesus did not have to go and set aside a special time to pray and fast for this situation. Why? If it requires prayer and fasting, why didn't you, Jesus, go and spend some time praying and fasting? The answer has to be, he was already living a life of prayer and fasting, which his disciples were not. Hmm? So Jesus' lifestyle of prayer and fasting was one of constantly resisting unbelief. Are you hearing me? Now we see that in actual uh, uh, operation when, when he was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness. Okay, the Holy Ghost came upon Jesus at baptism. He was anointed. And the Bible says God, the Spirit, led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, right? So Jesus went into the wilderness, spiritual warfare. We want to see how Jesus is showing us that fasting needs to be a part of our arsenal, right? So he goes into the, the, the wilderness and the devil begins to attack, right? How, how does the devil attack? He bombards Jesus' mind with thoughts in order to plan doubt into Jesus' mind. That's all he's doing. He's putting thoughts into Jesus' mind to put doubt and to create unbelief in the mind of Jesus. Now, if Jesus had accepted that and succumbed to the doubt and unbelief the enemy was trying to plan his mind, he would have been defeated. So Jesus implored a strategy for dealing with the attacks of doubt and unbelief that the enemy was throwing his way. What was the strategy? He went in the wilderness and the Bible says he not only prayed, but he fasted. During that time when the enemy was trying to bombard him with doubt, if you are the son of God, if you are this, if you are that, the way Jesus dealt with it and the strategy Jesus employed to overcome the doubts and unbelief the enemy was bombarding him with was to engage in prayer and fasting. And because he added fasting to his prayer, Jesus' spiritual senses were very sharp. And he was able to accurately discern and distinguish between what was from the devil and what was of God. Amen? He was able to identify and cast down those doubts. And he successfully did that. When he came out of the wilderness experience, he emerged victoriously, full of the Holy Spirit, full of power, in the position for God to use him mightily, and God surely did. Amen? And that is exactly the kinds of experiences we're going to have. Because when we go into this the way Jesus did and we allow God to just um, sharpen us and, 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 and we get into that word and, and, all, and, and we just get built up and our spiritual senses are sharp, we're going to come out of this time of prayer and fasting. Amen. Full of the spirit. Amen. And better positioned to be used by God and to deal with the enemy in our lives. Now, you got to want this enough to, 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 to be willing to do it. If you don't want it enough, then, of course, you're not going to do anything I'm saying. But if you, if you want spiritual empowerment, if you want advancement, if you want to start perceiving more accurately and become more conscious of the spirit world and of what God has done and what is available to you in Christ so that God's presence and power and miraculous power can begin to work more powerfully in you, through you, and for you, then, ladies and gentlemen, take advantage of this opportunity to fast. Amen? But don't just fast once in a while when you get a crisis. Let this become a way of life. Start to live a fasted life so that you are always resisting unbelief because the enemy is always going to be bombarding your mind with unbelief. And your physical senses are his ally. You look around, you hear, you feel, you touch. Everything you see and touch and feel tells you you know, don't believe God. It won't work. Give up. 
I mean, that's what that's the enemy's strategy. He's going to keep fighting, and he's going to keep, and he, 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 it's worked so well. Well, why change? Hmm? But if you understand that's the case, and you understand, okay, the, 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 what God has given me in order to resist unbelief is prayer and fasting, then that's what you need to do. Now, let me tell you what fasting is, okay? Say to your neighbor, fasting is not dieting. <laughs> Amen. Fasting is intentionally giving up food. Say food. F-O-O-D. I know nowadays we want to fast the internet and we want to fast TV and, and we want to, and we say, listen, if, you, if you're spending too much time on the internet and TV, that's, it's a good thing to, to fast that. But when the Bible is talking about fasting, it's talking about F-O-O, uh -huh, that thing you love so much. You know, it was, it was because of food that Adam and Eve fell. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, fasting is giving up food, but not just giving up food. The purpose for which you give up, food, give up food is what makes it a fast or diet. So if you're giving up food or limiting the intake of food because you want to lose weight, I mean, some of the folks in Hollywood do that to lose weight because they're going to the Oscars. You follow me? And they put themselves on a strict quote-unquote fast, but that's not a biblical fast. That's a diet. Okay? That's not what you want to do. Don't go into this. Your primary goal is, I want to lose weight. Because that's all you're going to get out of it. Jesus said that there's some people who fast to be seen. He said, if you're, being, if you're fasting to be seen, but that's your reward. If that's what you wanted, that's what you're going to get. You, people will see you fasting. That's your reward. So if you go into this primarily to lose weight, after 21 days, you will get your reward. You, that dress that couldn't fit you will fit you. <laughs> Amen. And you'll look the way you want to look, okay? But, but that's not, that's, if that's what you want, that's not a fast, okay? The purpose of a fast is to intentionally, purposefully give up food and limit other physical gratifications in order to, and this is it, to focus on God and to give yourself to prayer. Did you hear what I said? So I'm fasting when I say I'm pushing away the plate. I'm not going to eat anything for a period of time or I'm going to severely limit my intake of food so that my spiritual senses are strengthened, my physical, the influence of my physical senses on my mind is diminished because I want to focus on God and give myself to prayer during this period. Did you hear me? When you fast, you intentionally and purposefully are saying no to your fleshly desires so you can say yes to your spiritual appetites. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. He shall not live by rice and and chicken and uh, steak and potatoes and, and fufu and uh, uh, papusa and, and, and all of those good things. I shouldn't be talking about that while I'm telling you to go fast, right? <laughs> Bishop, be merciful to us. You're creating these images in our minds. The enemy is using you now. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. But we, we thank God for those things, and there are plenty of time for us to eat. Okay? But Jesus said, you can't live by that alone. You live by every word, and that's your spirit. Your spirit needs the word. But you see, what affects your spirit will eventually affect all of you. So that's the wonderful thing about this. When your spirit is being fed and your spiritual senses are being sharpened and your mind is coming under the influence of your spirit, guess what? Your entire life will be impacted for the better. Spiritually, emotionally, physically, you will see benefits. But your purpose for the next 21 days is, I am not going to eat for a period of time or I'm going to severely limit what I eat because I want my senses, my physical senses to be weakened. I want the influence of my mind to diminish. 
and I want the influence of my spiritual senses to be strengthened upon my mind because I want to become more conscious of God and of the invisible and of God's grace and God's love than I ever have before so I can start walking in a greater level of faith and have less trouble with unbelief. Do you understand? That is what you and I are to engage in for the next 21 days. Hallelujah. Now I want to encourage you. Again, if you have never fasted before, obviously it's going to be difficult. Uh, but, but claim the grace of God to go through this. Okay? Claim the grace of God to go through this. And claim the promise that Jesus made. Jesus said to his disciples and to the people, he said, listen, don't fast the way these Pharisees fast to be seen. He says, but if you will fast properly, if you will truly fast for the right reason, and, and you will not eat or limit your foods and come into the presence of God and close your doors and, and seek God and focus on God and give yourself to prayer. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, he said, your heavenly father, your heavenly father who sees in secret, who sees in secret, who sees you praying, who sees you limiting your food intake because you want to focus upon him and you want to give yourself to prayer. Your heavenly father who sees you being serious and diligent about your relationship with him. Your heavenly father who sees you putting the things of God first. He say he is going to reward you openly. So let me declare over all of us who will engage in this time of prayer and fasting in order to focus upon God, in order to give ourselves a prayer. I'm declaring every one of us will come out of this time of prayer and fasting and we are going to experience the open reward in the name of Jesus. Our Heavenly Father will openly reward you. Our Heavenly Father will openly reward me. What will he reward you with? He's going to reward you with greater faith. He's going to, he's going to reward you with greater authority. He's going to reward you with a greater sense of himself, his love, his power. He's going to reward you with a greater manifestation of his grace and power in and through your life. He's going to reward you with some breakthroughs in some areas that you have been waiting for a breakthrough in. It can be an area in your finances or in your health or in your family or with your children or with your ministry. I don't know what it is, but let's go into this believing that as we seek our God and as we focus upon our God, God, and as we give ourselves to prayer that we might know him, amen, that he will so shopping our spiritual senses, we'll become so conscious of his presence, our faith will go to another level, we shall begin to speak and decree things and not doubt, and they shall start coming to pass in our lives. Say hallelujah, so let it be, so let it be in the mighty mighty name of Jesus. Let me give you one last reason why fasting is so, so powerful. Peter said, God, in 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace that is power, ability, favor, breakthrough, Hmm, that you don't deserve, he gives grace. That is the answer to every question, the solution to every problem. He gives grace to the humble. To the what? To the what? Now, when you engage in a biblical fast correctly, that's one of the greatest acts of humility that you and I can engage in. When I fast or you fast, we're actually humbling ourselves before God. And the Bible says when we humble ourselves before him, we put ourselves in the position for him to give us more grace. And the grace is the answer. Hmm? You say, Bishop, why do you say fasting is an act of humility? Listen to me. If you were to go tomorrow, if you were planning to run a race this week, say a marathon or, 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 or something, but, but you had to run a race or you had to play a game that required a lot of energy and strength, um, and the outcome of that game or the outcome of that race depended upon you and your strength and your ability. Would you go without food? No. You would want to eat well. You would try to eat right. But you want to eat the right kinds of foods so that you can be nourished, so that you can be strong, so that you can be healthy because you know that the outcome of this race 
is dependent upon your strength. So when something depends upon you, you want to eat. To have the energy in order to do what needs to be done. Hmm? So when you decide you're not going to eat, the fact is the reason you said I'm not going to eat is because you already reached the conclusion this thing does not depend upon me. You're saying, I, I, I can never be strong enough. I can't do this. It's impossible for me to do this. So the outcome here is not dependent upon me. The victory I'm looking for here is not coming from me. It has to come from God. Mm-hmm. So a person who chooses to fast has, is humbling himself and admitting before God, God, unless you do this, it will not be done. I'm not able to do it. I don't have the strength, power, ability to solve this problem. It's beyond me. I have given up trying to solve this thing myself. Now I'm casting my cares completely upon you. If you read the rest of that, he says, God resists the proud. He says, casting your cares upon him. That's an act of humility when you fast and you cast all your care upon the Lord. I said, Lord, you got to do it because I can't. I'm taking my hands off of it. This doesn't depend. So, so when you choose to fast, you are actually humbling yourself and saying to God, it has to be you. My eyes are on you. I'm depending upon you. I'm trusting you. If you don't do it, it won't be done, but I believe you will. That is humility, and that kind of humility puts you in a position for grace to manifest. And that's why people who fast correctly so often have wonderful testimonies. Because when you are weak, Paul said, you're strong. I've discovered, Paul said, that when I'm weak, I'm strong because he says, ah, God told me that his strength, his power is made perfect when I'm weak. When I'm unable, when I'm, I've given up in, in, in being able to do this myself, and therefore I'm totally dependent upon God, that's when God's power flows through me and his power is made perfect. Are you hear me? So when you engage in a fast today or you engage in a fast this week uh, or for the rest of your life as you live a fasted life, every time you're fasting, you're humbling yourself. You're saying, God, I, it's, it's, my eyes are upon you. I'm totally dependent upon you. And when you live that way, not putting your confidence in your flesh at all, but constantly putting your confidence in God, constantly humbling yourself, you are going to be a channel and a recipient of grace like you've never seen before. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.